the executions increase almost every day. Oh. Even if I, even if I were not at that spot where I used to take my animals for pasture, the next day I would see evidence crosses, mm. little graves, big graves. Elderly, the, the cane would be stuck in the ground in somebody's grave because there was so much suspicion the Germans could not trust anybody. They were under attack from many yeah. sides. Yeah. And people were disappearing, moving out of the city. Mm -hmm. You wake up in the morning and, and somebody's house is vacant. Even you don't suspect anything a night before. You don't know who lives next door to you. Wow. Uh, what they could do to you. And fortunately, mm -hmm. nobody attacked us. Mm -hmm. But every day, less and less local people in the city, the immigrants, the people who were running from Ukraine, the refugees, were, especially of German descent, were more and more in the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was, it was kind of like almost like a, an animal market, wow. changing hands all the time. Hmm. And uh, as people were disappearing, the soldiers were going all over outside of the edges of the city and using this long pin trying to locate where people buried in the ground in the night. What would they bury? Whatever they had, they, they, they couldn't just put on a wagon and go. Mm -hmm. They take their family and, and walk out, and the rest mm -hmm. was buried somewhere. Hopefully, the Germans would not discover it. Mm. And they so had to live somehow. Eventually, find it. So the Germans would poke in to try to find it and then steal it, basically take right. it. Huh? Wow. Claim it. They didn't yeah. call it steal it. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Huh. So th this kind of thing was, was, and uh, so September, of course, as a kid, uh, war becomes like a movie to you. The reality is no longer there. It's, it's uh, it becomes a norm of life. It's like I watch those poor people in the Middle East, what they go through, and the children, what the children have to live through. And they, they chase a, a soccer ball and mm -hmm. try to have some normal life yeah. amidst the living in the middle of the, of the hell. Yeah. You know? And so yeah. I, I was taking care of animals and uh, we had some sheep in the village so that were staying with the relatives. So when the relatives came to Petriko, the sheep came with them. I had this ram that I learned how to ride. Oh, fine. I raised him from the river. Oh, fine. And I'd get on the top like a cowboy and go all over the place. Huh? And one day, I don't know whose idea it was, my sister and I, my older sister, three years old, I decided to dress this ram into my brother's coat. <laughs> my brother was uh, three years old. And, and so we got hold of this ram and we put the coat and buttoned up and put the front legs through. Mm. And, and so the ram, we released it and the ram, ram ran to, towards sheep and the sheep would not accept him. <laughs> they were running from him. Oh, and the ram would be running, ah, uh, and they'd run from him, and we decided <laughs> this is not going to work. <laughs> Either the ram is going to go crazy or the rest of the sheep will, will just drop dead. Right. We had to catch the ram and, and unbutton that coat. And then stuff like, uh, I would I would take have to take my animals to a certain area, and there are fences and fences everywhere. Mm. I would put... Uh, my coat on the fence and make a motion and my ram would back off, back off, and then he'd run and wham, hit that fence, the 
things would collapse and I would take my herd. Oh, my stuff, word. Stuff like that. Wow. It, it looks for entertainment. Yeah. Uh, without uh, being responsible. Uh, hmm. uh, and then early, early October, in Russian literature, there is a song. I don't know if it's Lermontov who wrote the words for it. It's called Utra Tumanneya, Utra Sidoya. Utra Tumanneya, morning, a foggy morning. Mm -hmm. Utra morning Sidoya, gray morning. Mm -hmm. And gray in every sense of the word. Mm -hmm. The light snow fell down. The day before that, we were ordered to evacuate. The Germans were expecting a, a strong push mm. from the partisans from across the river. Mm. They were preparing for battle. New forces were on, arriving every day. Mm. They were reinforcing themselves. The Germans. And they didn't want civilians in the mm -hmm. And so they, we were, as, as those who were considered allies in a, in a way the Germans, that we were anti-communists at least they knew we were given the first opportunity to leave hmm. we couldn't go back to where the other people were going right. we had to we had to push towards Poland and so the, the German command said that if you make it to the train station which was about 30 kilometers Wow. We will, we will uh, let you board the cattle train to mm -hmm. Poland. Mm -hmm. And so, a whole night, imagine you're given a, a, a news like that, a, and anything you have, and, and ah. uh, you have to get ready in the night, and then mm -hmm. you have to walk 30 kilometers mm -hmm. to the train station without sleep. And little kids. Yeah. And uh, being nine years old and full of mischief, uh, I was watching this whole thing, and it, it didn't really set in on me the way it did on, on the adults. Uh, the, the emotion, the, mm -hmm. leaving your area for to no, to go where, mm -hmm. what's going to be there? It, it, it's a very difficult time for. Uh, parents to, to deal with, but as a kid, women were cutting up the pillows because they wanted to, they couldn't take the pillows with them, mm. so they thought if they take the material at least, they can make a shirt out of that. Mm. It's not like today you go <laughs> in somewhere and people drop in the used clothes and you put right. them on. Right. You had to make everything. Every, mm. every piece of thread, you had to make it, spin mm. it. And, mm. and so, uh, a pillowcase was a valuable thing. So they they let the pillows, uh, cut the pillowcase, and they, they had, traditionally, Russians had pillow, big pillowcases. Mm. So to take the material, they had to get rid of the feathers. So they cut the pillows, and and, and dump the feathers in the in the hallway, kind of in one corner. Mm. Well, I got the brainy idea. What to do with the feathers? <laughs> These are white goose feathers, mm. and I spread them all over the yard. I created artificial snow. Mm. I was so proud of it. <laughs> Just when I finished, my grandpa walked out and he stepped on it. And he was in shock. What is this? And the stuff was sticking to his feet. And it was drizzling outside. Mm. What is this? And then he looked at me, and he realized I did it. And he was looking for, for something to, <laughs> to whip me. <laughs> I just called quickly. <laughs> well, we got up in the morning, and there was a, a light snow, maybe two inches on, mm. on the ground. Mm. So 
overcast sky. Everything quiet, dead, like gray morning, like the song says. Gray morning. And that feeling gripped me. You're leaving you're leaving behind everything that you remember up to that point. And you have to go somewhere and may never come back again. And we, the, the wagons, maybe 50 or more wagons, lined up on the street so before taking off. everybody that could in the village, in that city, was leaving together? Well, mostly people who were on the German side, so to speak, mm -hmm. who were not communists. Mm -hmm. okay. They wanted to get away from the front. But there's a whole lot of you. It wasn't just your family this time. Oh, no. Hmm. At least 50 wagons. Wow. Family wow. And children. And so, when the, when, so we, 7 o'clock in the morning, we had to line up. Hmm. And in that cold and snow, we had to take off hmm. for 30 kilometers. Hmm. By the time we, we made it. First 15 kilometers was noontime, mm. and the snow melted and everything was slush and mud, and, mm -hmm. and uh, of course people weren't, you know, it's like after you spend so many years as a refugee, you learn a lot, mm. but uh, by the time you learn, you go through the process of dragging this and that, you're going to bend in it anyway. Right. But what am I going to do? What about pots and pans? Mm. What about pillows and mm. stuff like that? You need all those things for family. Mm. But you you drop it somewhere anyway. Mm. Mm. And so about two ways into this journey, like a procession, Mm. Wagon after wagon, and every wagon goes through deeper holes in the mm. ground and mud, and, and you go through this, and you know Belarus is a is a muddy, swampy country. And this man began to agitate that we need to turn around and go back, mm. and he. He was boisterous and loud. I don't know what his position was mm -hmm. on, on German force or in, in police. Or so. He was one of the men who served on German police. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he was going to turn the, the whole... Wow. Wow. And uh, incidentally, they, these men were armed. They had guns on, on their shoulders. So all of the all of the men. Yeah, because partisans could attack them anywhere and mm -hmm. kill and mm -hmm. take horses and mm -hmm. and oxen. So I remember my father walking up to him and said to him, Do you want to go back? Turn your back and go back. Nobody's stopping me. Mm. And uh, he was going to try to raise his voice. He was close to six feet tall. He was mm. a strong man. Mm. He was no match for my father. <laughs> One minute. And uh, and father was serious. Mm. And when, when he raised his voice, my Father's cousin had an axe on his side, and he put his hand on, on the axe mm. and stepped, to him, stepped up to him and, and said, make your decision now, mm. and don't disrupt the people. Mm -hmm. And so he shut up, and for the rest of the trip, he, so he kept going. Kept going with oh. us. He didn't go back there. So.